When you look at the cells that make up an individual, you see there are cells of all different shapes, sizes, structures and functions. Yet they all contain the same genome. Their DNA sequence is basically identical. So how are there so many different cells when they have the same genomic DNA? Well, this is in large part due to expression of different sets of genes in different cells. The genome of an individual contains all the genes for that individual, but only a specific subset of all these genes are used or expressed in different cells. And there are many proteins in cells whose role it is to control the expression of other genes, to make it possible to turn sets of genes on or off in different cell types. These proteins are called transcription factors, since they control the expression of other genes by regulating the process of gene transcription. Different cell types contain different combinations of transcription factors, so that different sets of genes are transcribed depending on which transcription factors are present. Here we have a diagram of a typical eukaryotic gene, and we see that the transcription factors bind to stretches of DNA referred to as regulatory regions, or cis regulatory modules, CRMs. When the transcription factors bind to DNA in the CRM regions, they will interact with other proteins to regulate the DNA polymerase enzyme, shown here in green, that drives transcription, turning gene expression on or off by either activating or repressing transcription. We often indicate CRMs and the sites where the transcription factors bind to the DNA with color or highlighted regions, as in this figure, where the blue, green, purple, and red regions indicate transcription factor binding sites, and the correspondingly blue, green, purple, and red colored shapes indicate the transcription factor proteins bound to the DNA. Now let's look at a specific example. This figure shows a zoomed in view of the regulatory region of the EAT4 gene from the nematode worm C. elegans. And when we look at this regulatory region in a specific neuron, a type of taste receptor cell called ASE, we find that expression of the EAT4 gene in this cell is controlled by transcription factors that include CEH36, shown here by the blue shapes, and CHE1, shown here by the purple shape. The specific stretches of DNA that these transcription factor proteins bind to are indicated by the segments of the line shown in corresponding shades of blue and purple. But remember that these colored regions of the lines are just representations of double-stranded DNA with a sequence of nucleotide bases of A's, T's, G's, and C's. If we focus in on the DNA segment where the CHE1 transcription factor is bound, we would find that the purple line indicates a specific stretch of DNA with the sequence GAAACC. Since DNA is double-stranded, the bottom strand of the sequence is the reverse complement of the top, with G paired with C and A paired with T. This allows us to use shorthand and refer to the entire sequence using just the basis of the top strand, the GAAACC. But we can deduce what the bottom strand sequence must be using the rules of DNA base pairing. By convention, for the shorthand, we take the top 5' prime to 3' prime sequence of the DNA when the gene is oriented such that transcription is proceeding to make a transcript in that same 5' prime to 3' prime direction. This is the DNA sequence to which CHE1 binds in the cis regulatory module of the EAT4 gene. The CHE1 transcription factor protein has a specific conformation and shape, enabling it to recognize and bind to this specific sequence, which we can write in shorthand like this. But CHE1 doesn't just participate in regulating expression of the EAT4 gene, it regulates other genes too. So we can ask, when CHE1 binds to the regulatory regions of other genes, what sequence is it recognizing and binding to? Is it always GAAACC, or does it vary? If it varies, which bases change? All of them, or just some? Here we have some examples of DNA sequences that CHE1 has been found to bind to. There are six bases involved. We can see immediately that the first base is always G, and the second and third are always A. But the fourth is an A half of the time, and a G the rest of the time. The fifth is always a C, but then the sixth is usually a C, but occasionally a G. Analyzing the sequences in this way allows us to summarize and share information about what DNA sequences the
the CHE1 transcription factor protein binds to. We can present this information in a diagram like this, called a sequence logo. This logo is simply a diagrammatic representation of what we just reviewed. We created this logo for our example using just six known sequences, but this is usually done with a larger number. In sequence logos, the convention for a position like this last one, where the base can vary, is to put the most commonly occurring base on the top, like this C, and the least frequent variant on the bottom, like this G. Note that these logos give letters different heights, depending on how important they are for the binding of the transcription factor. The height of the letters is kind of proportional to the number of times that particular letter is found at that particular position in the known binding sites. But it's not simply proportional. If it was simply proportional, the logo would look like this on the right here, where the total height at each position is the same. But instead, the most important bases at specific positions, the ones that don't vary, are given a higher score, a higher total height. If the base at a position varies, the total height is lower, and the relative heights of the possible bases found at that position are related to how frequently each one is found. This type of logo on the left has some advantages. For example, you can see right away that these are the positions of the key bases that enable the CAG1 transcription factor to recognize and bind to this DNA sequence. If one of these essential bases in the sequence varies, then it's a bust. The CAG1 transcription factor is not going to bind to it. These bases at these positions are crucial for CAG1 to bind the DNA. And you can see that more easily from these weighted logos, like the one shown here, than from the strictly proportional representations. Sequence logos like these can help us visualize the consensus sequence of the binding site for a particular transcription factor. A consensus sequence is a single sequence that at each position shows the base that's most commonly found at that position in all the known binding sites being analyzed. But the sequence logos convey more information than just a consensus sequence. They show the relative importance of specific sequences in specific positions, and they indicate all the possible variants found in a particular position. Also, don't forget when looking at these logos that we're reading just the top strand of a double-stranded DNA molecule. The transcription factor protein itself is binding to the full double-stranded DNA molecule. And transcription factors don't usually bind to every occurrence of their binding site sequence that's found in the genome. Other factors, such as interactions with other proteins, or the accessibility of a stretch of DNA, can also influence whether or not a transcription factor will bind. Sequence logos like these have now been compiled to describe the binding sites for many different transcription factors. Here are just a few examples. These sequence logos provide a helpful way to describe the DNA sequences that specific transcription factors recognize and bind. And because different transcription factors recognize and bind to different sequences, they bind to different places in the genome and therefore regulate different sets of genes. In this way, it is the particular combination of transcription factors present in each cell that controls which genes in our genome are being expressed in each of the many different types of cells that make up an individual.